All right, hi guys. This video is going to go along with the classification notes. So this will be the um, last section in your notes already. So actually before today, before this moment, everything else in your notes packet should be complete. If you're flipping around and you're missing something, you need to go back, find it and complete them before you go to bed tonight. So, all right, let's take a look at classification. These should be pretty quick. So first of all, if we just look at uh, the diversity of organisms here on Earth. So there are 13 billion known species of organisms, and um, that accounts for about only 5% of all organisms that have ever lived, right? So really, you have to keep in mind also that what we see today is just a tiny fraction of what has already existed. Uh, new organisms are still being found and identified every single day. So the term classification is the arrangement of organisms into orderly groups based on their simil similarities. So you'll see today, and we'll do a lab in a couple of days, where you'll see like what the heck per, uh, characteristics they're actually looking at. Um, the term taxonomy is the field of science that does this. So for example, there are plant taxonomists that actually just deal with organizing and classifying plants or beetle taxonomists or fish taxonomists, right? So that is actually in, in and of itself a field of science where people are, you know, making uh, work in their careers. Okay, so the benefits of classifying organisms is that we can accurately and uniformly name organisms. Um, it prevents misnomers like the term starfish and jellyfish that aren't really fish at all. Um, and it allows science scientists to communicate. So um, because of our classification system, scientists can share data across the globe. So no matter what language they speak, every species that has been identified and classified has the same scientific name, no matter what language, which is really cool. So um, that allows for no confusion when it comes to talking about the species as particular species in this little hilarious comic, you can see that they're trying to identify this critter. One person calls it a skunk and the others have different words and they have no idea if they're on the same page. That looks miserable compared to, aha, mephitis, mephitis. And now they're all on the same page and then they know they're talking about the old striped skunk. Uh, so Carolus Linnaeus in the 1700s is responsible for our current classification system. So again, this was in the 18th century. Uh, he classified organisms based on their structures. And keep in mind that there were other scientists that were trying to organize organisms, but no one did it as well and as effectively as Linnaeus. And in fact, his system is still what we use today. So the term species is a group of organisms that are capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. That's the key. So the term species, when you're looking at beetles or ants in your backyard, there's probably multiple species of beetles and ants under a rock in your backyard. Um, but what we classify as one species of beetle is um, a group of organisms that are that can breed and have fertile babies, mean, meaning their babies can have babies. An example of not a new species, oh gosh, I always forget this. So a horse and a donkey. Horse and a donkey can have a baby that's a mule, right? But mules are not considered their own species because they are infertile. So mules don't have babies with other mules. It's not possible. Um, so genetically, it does not work out. So even though humans have found ways where like interbreeding organisms, everyone always in class brings up the liger. I don't really even know anything about the liger. Um, but we do we have successfully like bred different species but um and they produce a baby but it may be infertile like a mule okay um so when we look at our classification system um 
it starts with domain. So domain is the broadest category. And then we slowly get more narrow and more narrow and more narrow based on specific characteristics. So we go from domain all the way down to species, which is the most specific category. So here's an example of starting really broad with kingdom animalia, um, which includes all animals, right? And then we go down and in this case, we're gonna get a little bit more specific with phylum chordata, which is any organism with any chordate, which basically has a spinal cord. Um, and then we're now going to narrow it down even more to look at class mammalia, which includes any mammal. Order carnivora is um, any carnivores, so just meat eating. Ursidae is bears, so family Ursidae is all the bears. Genus Ursus, and ultimately the spe species here. Um, so ultimately we have just classified the grizzly bear, okay? Uh, so which animal is least like the others? That would be the one that get, got kicked out the first. So if we go way up here, that old sea star is considered to be an animal, but it got kicked off to begin with because it didn't, it is not considered to be a chordate. So it is least like the others, which is more like a grizzly bear. So now let's go all the way down to the bottom. Here's a grizzly bear. And we wanna know if it's the red fox or a squirrel. So which one was basically kicked off first? Well, if we go up here, here's the red fox, here's the squirrel. At this point, the squirrel got kicked off, but the fox continued to order carnivora. And so in that case, we would say, that the grizzly bear and the red fox are cl more closely related. Can a black bear mate with the grizzly bear? No, right? So keep in mind, you know, um, they have to be the same species in order to mate and have fertile offspring. Okay, so binomial nomenclature is the naming system. So every organism, every scientific organism has be been given a scientific name. Um, and that system is called binomial nomenclature. Um, it's a two where every organism gets a two word name. The first one is their genus and the second one is their species. It is italicized in print and underlined when you're writing it. So if you're writing it with your little handwriting, you'll underline scientific names. And if you're typing it, you'll make sure that it's italicized. The genus is capitalized, but the species is not. So let's look at some examples. So over here on the right, you can see the common name of this little beauty, which we have all over Kettering right now, are, is American Robin. So this is an American Robin. Um, that's the common name. The scientific name is Turtus migratorius. You can see because it's typed, it is in italics, and the genus is capitalized and the species is not. Here are uh, three more examples of common names. So we have the giant panda, the polar bear, the grizzly bear, and underneath it is their scientific name. So you'll notice that there is a genus and a species for each one of them. They are all in italics. Uh, the genus is capitalized and the species is not. Just by looking at the scientific names, sometimes you can tell which ones are pretty closely related. So guess which two are more closely related. So here are three bears, we call them bears, um, but two of them are more closely related than the other. And in this case, you can see it's going to be the polar bear and the grizzly bear because they're in the same genus. So these two are in the same genus called Ursus. Okay, there is, um, a special type of chart that I actually hadn't seen until recently. And they're all over their test. And I don't know why. No one, none of the bio teachers here understand why. why. But here we go. We're going to get a healthy dose uh, before they are a test of cladograms. So cladograms are diagrams that show how organisms are related based on shared derived characteristics such as feathers, hair, scales, things like that. So here's an example of a cladogram. Again, I, on, I had never seen one until a couple of years ago, but here we go. So uh, what we see here is they, they're organizing 
these organisms based on specific characteristics. Um, and I think of it as organisms like getting kicked off if they don't have that trait. So all of these organisms start here. I like to start on the bottom and I kind of read it up the cladogram like this. So when I get to vertebral column, only the organisms with a vertebral column can continue. In that case, the lancelet gets kicked off. So all of these organisms have a vertebral column. The next trait we're looking at is jawbone. So when we move up to jawbone, anything without a jawbone gets kicked off, which is going to be this lamprey, okay? Uh, the next trait is four-legged locomotion. So that grouper gets kicked off, which is a fish, and we move on, so forth and so forth. So the only one of all these animals that has all the traits is the wolf, right? So the last trait there was hair. And that, poor that poor turtle had been trudging along and got kicked off with the last trait, which was hair. Okay, so here's that same cladogram. How are lancelets different from all the others? So lancelets um, don't have vertebral column. Uh, what do salamanders have that groupers do not? So salamanders have four-legged locomotion and groupers do not. What's the difference between turtles and salamanders? Well, um, salamanders do not have amniotic eggs. And which one is most closely related to the wolf? So um, on these cladograms, typically you'll see that the ones that are physically more closer, that physically closer together will be true, you know, genetically closer together compared to these organisms. Um, so in this case, with these traits, a turtle, the turtle is more closely related to the wolf than the others. Um, here's a primate cladogram. Again, we, everyone in my head, I start here at the bottom and move up. And if we don't have that trait, you kick it off. So the first trait here is, actually, sorry, there's a list of things, right? And the ring-tailed lemur gets kicked off. Uh, we continue on, and the next one is central eye area for more accurate vision. The spider monkey gets kicked off, and we move on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, let me go back to this one really quick to just show you that in this case, with these traits, the chimpanzee is most closely related to a human than the other organisms. Okay, um, another thing we'll use to identify organisms is called a dichotomous key. So um, what we'll see with the, and we'll get practice with this, and there have been them on the air test, but these are, they're pretty easy. So dichotomous keys, um, it's gonna give characteristics in pairs, uh, you always start with statement number one at the top. You'll see what I mean. Um, read, always read both characteristics that are given. And then you either go to the next set of characteristics or you'll identify the organism. So let's do some practice. I have a couple in the notes and then we'll do some more in class. So here's an example of a dichotomous key. This one happens to have four questions. This one's really tiny. Um, I always like to, to put in perspective because this is so tiny. Um, in my plant taxonomy class in college, I was living, I was in school in South Carolina and I had to go buy this like $75 wildflowers of South Carolina dichotomous key, $75. I don't know what the heck that could possibly look like. So I get to the bookstore and it was this huge, I'm not kidding you, it was this thick of a dichotomous key of wildflowers in South Carolina. So that is obviously a huge dichotomous key, but you could plop anywhere in the forest of South, or anywhere in South Carolina, you could plop and identify a wildflower. So um, this is very simplified. So here we have four questions. Always start on question one, always, always, always. So let's do um, this one right here, this organism on the very bottom right. Okay, so, and read both um, options, right? So we always start on question one. A says tentacles present, B says tentacles absent. If you look, you can you can see there are in fact tentacles hanging down. So I pick tentacles present, which tells me to go to two. 
So I hop to question two. Eight tentacles are more than eight tentacles. And it's hard to see, but there are way more than eight tentacles. So that tells me to go to three. Tentacles hang down or tentacles upright? Now these tentacles are hanging down, so I go to four. Four says balloon shaped body or balloon not shaped or body not balloon shaped, sorry. Um, and this is balloon shaped, which tells me that it's a jellyfish. So you can see that in every option, it may tell you to go to another question or it may identify your critter. Here's another one. This one I think is in your notes. Um, yes. So what's the scientific name of this insect? So always start on question one and read both options. So organism has eight legs or organism has six legs. So if you look, there are six. There's um, a pair here up front, these little ones in the middle, and then these big jumping ones in the back. So there are six legs. So it says to go to number two. So we hop to question two. Organisms lack antenna or organism has an antenna? Um, they have two large antenna. So I'm going to go to three. Large hind legs for hopping or no large hind legs for hopping. In this case, they've got huge, nice big old legs for, for hopping. So I'm going to say A, and it then tells us the genus and the species, okay? So in your notes, you can write in this animal is and practice writing the scientific name. And remember to underline it also, since you're writing it in your own little letters. And I think that's it. So uh, you should have completed your notes packet, should be totally completed. In class, we'll get practice doing cladograms and uh, dichotomous keys and along the way with both of those looking at scientific names. So um, that should be it.